Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Yes? Man, I hope you're excited. Uh, tonight, we, we are getting a, a next visit from uh, Dr. Hugh Ross, and he's going to be here for the evening. And, and, and first, just have a, a presentation, and he's going to go through uh, just helping us uh, see kind of a little bit of his journey. Uh, and I'm excited. I hope you're excited uh, for, for his visit this evening. And then afterwards, hold on just a second, because we'll have some Q&A. So hopefully you have some questions uh, for Dr. Ross, and this I just want to explain so we can do this um, the best way possible and the easiest is what we're going to do on all of your mobile devices, okay, is get the RLC app. A lot of you have the RLC app. Right on there, there is a button that says Evening with Dr. Ross. Click on it, you type in your question, submit it, and then we'll be up here and we'll just start going through those questions uh, all together and uh, be able to go through that as well as afterwards. Uh, their resource table and staff will be out there for additional questions and you can pick up materials. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ross will be in the undergrounds and you can meet with him, ask some questions there as well. And we're just going to have a fun evening uh, hearing from Dr. Ross. So, without further ado, let's bring Dr. Ross out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it was our pleasure to be with you last September, and you heard a little bit about reasons to believe back then and some of the evidences that we have and a little bit about my story of how astrophysics brought me to faith in Christ. What I'm going to do this evening, as promised last September, is actually give you a formal presentation where we talk about some of the latest scientific evidences for the God of the Bible. As I mentioned when I was here in September, what I've discovered as I travel around the world is that most Christians simply aren't aware of the best evidences for the Christian faith. So I'm going to just pick one of those uh, segments of evidences, and um, I'm going to kind of wrap my personal story around. So some of it will be my personal story, about the evidences that, you know, 40 years ago brought me to faith in Christ, but I'm also going to update it with some scientific discoveries that literally have been discovered uh, just in the past few months, making the point that with every week goes by, we can make a stronger case that Jesus Christ is greater Lord and Savior. And then right here in the auditorium, we're going to take questions, any question you want to ask, and we'll let that go for a while. And then I'm going to move to the underground where we'll have a longer time uh, for questions and discussion. And feel free to go to our book table. We have a number of our trained apologists there. You can ask your questions there as well. But for those of you that weren't here last September, Reasons to Believe is an organization that my wife and I founded 28 years ago. And our reason for the organization is to demonstrate that the latest discoveries from God's second book. God gave us two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And we're told in the book of Romans that the book of scripture is where we get the evidences for God and his attributes, which leads us to the book of scripture. And so literally every day, research papers are being published that make for a stronger case for the Christian faith. And uh, we actually write articles in some of them. We call it Today's New Reason to Believe. Short articles that keep you up to date on some of the best new evidences for the Christian faith. Uh, They're free on our website. And uh, also, we like to jump on scientific discoveries that are making the public news literally within hours after they're uh, made. And we don't write articles here. Here we do podcasts, video podcasts or audio podcasts. Uh, that you can get through iTunes or Reasons.org. And now you can get it through the Reasons to Believe app. So if you've got a smartphone with you, feel free to download the Reasons to Believe app while I'm speaking. That will not offend me, uh, but that will automatically uh, keep you up to date uh, with a number of our resources. The rest of them are available on our website. And as you walked in, you should have gotten this little card, uh, which is a brief summary of the best scientific evidences for God and the uh, truthfulness of the Bible. Uh, So take that with you. Hopefully it will help you uh, uh, share your faith. But there's also a tear-off that you can do. And if you fill that out, 
uh, and hand it in, we'll give you a free copy of this DVD called Cosmic Fingerprints, uh, where I tell my story of how I came to faith in Christ uh, through astronomy and physics eight years before I met a Christian. That would never happen here in the U.S. I was born, raised, and educated in Canada. Uh, but uh, that's available on that uh, DVD. That DVD also shows me answering questions from skeptics. So that's free as you walk out uh, just for filling out that card. But as I mentioned, I was raised and educated in British Columbia, a beautiful place, but Christians are really hard to find there. I didn't get to meet a Christian to have any spiritual conversation with one until I was 27 years of age. But I began a serious study in astronomy when I was seven. Uh, my parents say I was born being a scientist. I started doing experiments since the time I was uh, two. And uh, at age seven, I wanted to know why the stars were hot. And they said, go to the library. So that's exactly what I did. And uh, ever since the age of seven, I've been fascinated by the galaxies and stars uh, that make up uh, the universe. And at age eight is when I recognized that astrophysics would be my future career. And from the time I was eight forward, I would spend a year studying in depth a subdiscipline of astronomy. So one year I looked at stellar atmospheres, another year at the physics of the stellar interiors. And it was at age 16 uh, that I began to uh, look at uh, cosmology. Now, Looking at uh, quasars and galaxies and stars led me to make some unexpected discoveries. And as I mentioned, at age 16, I devoted that year to studying cosmology. You might say, what on earth is cosmology? Well, believe it or not, the most frequent introduction when I'm in front of an audience like this is they introduce me as a cosmetologist. I'm not a cosmetologist, <laughs> nor am I an astrologer. So... Uh, but cosmology is the science of the origin, structure, and history of the universe. And when I was 16 is when there was a big debate. Does the universe arise from some kind of a steady state? Is it a hesitating universe model? Is it like what the Hindus teach, where you've got a reincarnating universe? Or is it Big Bang? Well, at age 16, I recognized that the evidence already was overwhelmingly favor the Big Bang Theory over all the alternate explanations for the universe. And I knew if it was Big Bang, the universe had to have a beginning. And if there was a beginning, a beginning there had to be a beginner. So from age 16 onwards, I did not doubt the existence of God. My astronomy proved to me there had to be some kind of God behind the universe. But um, being born and raised and educated in Canada... I was taught the scientific method in grade one. I Here in the U.S., they don't teach the scientific method in grade one, but we did. I got it in grade two. We got it every single year. So by the time I was 16, I was thoroughly steeped in the scientific method. And when I recognized that there had to be a God to explain the universe, I began to put to the test the different philosophical systems and religions of the world. I began with Descartes and Immanuel Kant, read what they had to say about the universe, and recognized that what they had to say uh, was um, incorrect. Uh, Immanuel Kant, for example, made the claim that God exists, but that God creates within space and time that eternally exists. And when I was, you know, in my teenage years, is when physicists were demonstrating that time and space uh, don't exist until the universe is created. So I put aside uh, those philosophers, and I began to go through the world's holy books one at a time. And uh, I went through the Hindu Vedas, and that's the uh, religious textbook that teaches that the universe has multiple beginnings. So the universe has a beginning, it ends, it restarts, it ends, and it restarts. And uh, the Hindu Vedas tell us there's 4.32 billion years between one beginning of the universe and the next beginning or reincarnation. And at age 16, I realized that number had to be wrong. The universe was older than 4.32 billion years of age. But I also realized the universe had an entropy measure 
that was at least 100 million times too high uh, to make it possible for the universe to have any rebounding or restarting mechanism. So I put Hinduism aside. Now, the high school I was going to was uh, 80% Asian in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. We had a lot of Buddhists in that uh, school, and they encouraged me to look at their commentaries. But as I looked at the Buddhist commentaries, I realized they basically taught the same thing about the universe that the Hindu Vedas did. So I put that aside. And we had some immigrants uh, from the Middle East in our school. Basically, I was raised in a high school that was filled with refugees from around the world. And uh, we had a couple of Muslims. I looked at the Quran. And uh, as I read through the Quran, I uh, recognized that it had creation texts, but they contradicted one another. And one in particular said that the planets are more distant than the stars. And even with the naked eye, you can tell that that's not true. The stars are far more distant uh, than the planets. Um, and I also figured it had to be written by a man because it said the gestation period for the woman was six months rather than nine months. <laughs> so I put that aside. And we had one student in our high school who was of the Baha'i faith. And, you know, as I was talking to him, he said, well, what we do in Baha'i is we take the kernels of truth out of all the world's religions and put them together into a consistent package. So I says, great, show me what you got. And a week later, I went back to him and said, well, from what I can tell, what you and Baha'i have done is to take the great errors of the world's religions and put them together into an inconsistent package. And he wound up leaving the Baha'i faith. Now, when I told you earlier, I didn't meet Christians until I was 27 years of age. That was to get close enough to a Christian where I could have some kind of spiritual conversation. That didn't happen until I joined the faculty of Caltech uh, after I got my PhD. But at age 11, I did get to see uh, two Christians from about 30 feet away. These were two businessmen that came into our public school put two boxes on our teacher's desk and left without saying a single word. But in those boxes were Gideon Bibles. And our teacher invited us to come forward and take one if we wanted one. And every one of us took one. And I still carry that Gideon Bible around with me that I got at age 11. And it stayed on my bookshelf untouched, unread for six years. Not until I was 17, after I'd been exposed to the cosmology, looked at uh, the, the uh, great philosophers and went through these other holy books, I finally picked this up. And you say, why did you leave it to the end? I knew it would be the greatest challenge. And what, one principle you learn in science is this, always tackle the easy problems first and then the most difficult at the end. And so I began to go through this book. And the first thing I noticed is how differently it was written. It was clear, it was direct, it was not repetitious. I mean, if you look at the Vedas, for example, or the Quran, highly repetitious, very vague language, and full of a lot of esoteric kind of talk. And I said, that's the way you write if you're trying to impress somebody. And I said, that's what a human being would do. When I picked up this book, there was none of this esoteric poetry. Uh, none of this appeal to intellectual snobbery. It was clear, direct. Uh, naming, giving names, dates, places, full of geography, history, and science. And I said, this I can put to the tests. Now, this is the only book I picked up that actually commanded objective testing. Four times in the Bible, we're told to put everything to the test. Here's one example from uh, the New Testament. Test everything, hold on to the good. Now, what particularly impressed me about the Bible, not only did it command objective testing, it showed me step by step how to put everything to the test. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I was taught the scientific method in grade one, grade two, grade three, every single grade. But none of my public school teachers told me where the scientific method came from. When I picked up this Bible that the Gideons gave me, the scientific method literally popped out of the very first page. I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. And it's no accident that the scientific revolution exploded out of Reformation Europe. 
This is when people began to read the Bible for themselves and those of a scientific bent saw this biblical testing method in the text. They began to apply it to their scientific studies. That was the birth of the scientific method and the launch of the scientific revolution. Notice in the non-biblical cultures, science had sparks, but science was still born. It never got any traction. Whereas in Reformation Europe, it not only got traction, it exploded and continues to explode to this very day. Now what I want to show you, and this was a huge factor in my signing my name in the back of this Gideon Bible, giving my life to Jesus Christ, was discovering the scientific method in the very first page of the Bible. And what I learned when I came here to the United States is that people in the church view Genesis 1 as the most difficult text to defend in front of skeptics. For me, it was the text that brought me to the faith in Christ. But it's because I followed the scientific method in analyzing the text. So as we look at the text, it says, Genesis 1.1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I was curious as a 17-year-old, what does the Bible mean by the heavens and the earth? And so I began to read through the Old Testament, and I discovered the Old Testament never uses the word universe. And I did some study and discovered in Hebrew, the language in which the Old Testament is written, there is no word for universe. Instead, they have this phrase, the heavens and the earth with the definite articles. Shows up nine times in the Old Testament and always means the totality of physical reality. Not only all matter and energy, but even space and time itself. Now, I was reading the Bible for the first time at the same time that physicists in Britain were developing the first of the space-time theorems. I've got them in my briefcase here, but uh, this is the one that put um, Stephen Hawking to worldwide fame. He and Roger Penrose, back in 1970, published this theorem in which they were able to demonstrate, based on only two conditions, if the universe contains mass, and all of you are living proof that the universe contains mass, some of you a little more so than others. And if the universe, if the equations of general relativity reliably describe the movements of bodies in the universe, then Hawking and Penrose proved that the universe has a beginning that includes the beginning of space and time itself. As Hawking later boasted when he was interviewed for Reader's Digest, we proved that time was created. Now, I remember studying that as a young man and realizing he not only proved that time was created, he proved that the Bible of all the world's holy books got it right. What I found in the non-biblical religions of the world, they tell us that God or God or cosmic forces create within space and time that eternally exists. And as I mentioned earlier, that's what the great philosopher said. But the Bible stood alone in saying, no, space and time don't exist until God creates the universe. And now we have these space-time theorems that actually prove that that indeed is correct. Which is why the latest book being published by Lawrence Krauss, uh, probably our nation's most famous atheist, what he wrote in his book, Universe from Nothing, is we no longer can avoid a deistic interpretation of reality because of these space-time theorems, we're forced to conclude there must be a God beyond space and time that created the universe. In fact, the battlefield today in atheistic science is not against the existence of God, but against the existence of a personal God. Now, I remember debating Michael Shermer of the Skeptic Society. Uh, I've actually debated him four times, and uh, he's fond of ridiculing Genesis 1. And the thing he threw up was, well, you look at Genesis 1, what's God doing between creating the universe and forming the earth? I mean, the astronomical record tells us there's 9 billion years between the creation of the universe and the formation of the earth. Was God taking a long nap? How come the Bible is silent on that? Well, here's my response. Genesis is silent on that, but not the rest of the Old Testament. In fact, you'll find 11 places outside of Genesis that tells us what God was doing between the creation of the universe and the formation of the earth. What he was doing was stretching out the heavens. 
Now, that's what you'll see in your English translations. But if you look at these 11 texts, the actual Hebrew word is the word nata, which means the expansion of what is being described. Now, that had a huge impact on me as a 17-year-old because I recognized that no scientist had even dreamed of the idea of an expanding universe until Albert Einstein produced his theory of general relativity. And George Lemaitre and Edwin Hubble discovered that indeed observations show that the universe is expanding. For thousands of years, the Bible stood alone as the only book of science, philosophy, or theology that declared that we live in an expanding universe. Now, that means that the Bible has predictive power. It's actually predicting future scientific discoveries thousands of years ahead of its time. And as a young man that impressed me, this can't come from a human being. This indeed must be inspired by the one that created the universe. Now, I've written an entire book, The Creator and the Cosmos, where I lay out the evidence that we live in a continually expanding universe. What I'm going to do this evening is just show you one slide. Um, This is from the Hubble Space Telescope. And you'll see an image on the uh, left there that shows you galaxies located 12 billion light years away which means it took the light 12 billion years to reach us. Or to put it another way, we're looking at the universe as it was 12 billion years ago. Contrast with a slide where we see it just 2 billion light years away, just 2 billion years ago. And purposely, I've put these two images to scale. The size scale is the same. And so you can see here that the galaxies over that 10 billion year period have indeed spread apart or stretched out as the universe expanded. And if I had time, I could show you dozens of other Hubble Space Telescope images at different look-back times, demonstrating that indeed the Bible got it right. We do live in a continuously expanding universe. Now, where skeptics like Michael Shermer trip up is they don't realize that the frame of reference changes from Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 1-2. It was Galileo who said the biggest mistake you can make in Bible interpretation is to get the wrong frame of reference. And that's step one of what we call a scientific method. Don't interpret until you establish the point of view or the frame of reference. Notice what it says in Genesis 1-2. God was hovering over the surface of the waters of planet Earth which means we're to understand the description of the six creation days from the point of view of an observer on the surface of the waters. Now, those of you who are familiar with the scientific method will recognize step two, do not interpret until you establish the initial conditions or the starting conditions. But that too is included in Genesis 1-2. The Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters, and it tells us it's dark on the surface of the waters. The water covers the entire surface of the earth and is empty of life and unfit for life. So those are the four initial conditions before God begins his creative activity in the six creation days. It's dark everywhere on the surface of the earth. Water covers the whole surface of the earth. It's unfit for life, and it's empty of life. Then we get into creation day one. Notice that the text says, let there be light. It doesn't say that God created light. It doesn't say that God made the light. It says, let the light be. Well, again, as a young scientist, I looked at the text and said, this must be referring to the atmosphere where God transforms the atmosphere from opaque to translucent, where the primordial earth would have a cloud layer that would not let any light pass through. If you want a good analogy, look at Venus. Venus is an atmosphere 40 times thicker than the Earth. And the only light that gets through is infrared light or deep red light. All the other uh, colors of the spectrum are blocked out by the atmosphere. And we know the Earth began with an atmosphere three times thicker than that of Venus. No light would have gotten through at all. But God transforms the atmosphere from opaque to translucent. And now light can come through to the surface and photosynthesis can begin. Life can begin to flourish in the oceans. Now, this is implicit in Genesis 1, but it's explicit in Job 38. 
And as I read through the Old Testament in my teenage years, I realized there are three texts that also take you through the six creation days. Job 37 through 39, Psalm 104, and Proverbs 8. And so if you want to understand the scientific details and the chronology, it's important to look at those additional texts. But notice what Job 38 says about creation day one, the events before creation day one. God speaks and says, I made the cloud its garment, referring to the pervasive oceans, and wrapped it in thick darkness. So notice in Job it tells us why it's dark. Not because the sun, moon, and stars did not exist, but because the atmosphere was opaque to light. Now, in this DVD, and we got a whole bunch of copies of this out at the table, and hey, uh, we actually have them in 11 different languages. So if you know people who uh, speak Farsi, uh, or French, or German, or Mandarin, or Russian, or whatever, uh, feel free to share this with them. It's a television documentary that we produced a few years back where I take you on a journey from the surface of the earth to the very edge of the universe. And the idea is this. The farther away you look, the farther back in time you see. And we can actually now see so far back in time, we can watch God create the universe. So are you really kidding about this? I can actually show you an image of what the universe was like. Uh, thanks to radio astronomy, when the universe was only 100 billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. That's so close we can get to the cosmic creation event. But in this DVD, I also show you how it is that our Earth's atmosphere went from opaque to translucent. Basically what happened is the orbit of the Earth had two planets. There was the Earth and a planet more than twice the size of Mars. And that planet very slowly creeped towards the Earth, collided with the Earth when it had a very thick atmosphere and a very deep ocean. And that collision caused Earth to lose over 99% of its water and 99% of its atmosphere. It also formed a debris cloud that formed the moon. And without that huge moon orbiting our small planet, our rotation axis would do this and advanced life would not be possible. I don't know about your family, but when we celebrate Thanksgiving, we thank God for the moon. Because without the moon, we wouldn't have that stable tilt of our rotation axis. But that moon-forming event is what transformed our atmosphere from translucent to transparent. Now, it also did something else. On creation day two, it says, let there be water above and water below. That's a reference to the water cycle. Now, it's just one sentence. But if you go to Job 37 and the first part of Job 38, it talks in detail about the water cycle that God established on creation day two. In fact, if you read through Job, you'll find that the water cycle is set up with 16 different kinds of precipitation. And we need every one of them uh, for life to be possible. Here are the six main ones. You need rain, mist, and dew in terms of liquid precipitation. And in terms of frozen precipitation, you need snow, frost, and hail. Without at least those six kinds, you're not going to be able to grow the quantity of crops that we're able to grow over all the continental land masses and thereby sustain global high-technology civilization. But it was this collision event designed in just a certain way that actually not only gave the Earth sufficient mass, because the problem with Earth is this, it needs to be massive enough that it doesn't lose water vapor to outer space, but it also needs a thin atmosphere. And so a planet the size of Earth would have an atmosphere far too thick, but thanks to this collision event, we get the mass we need, uh, we get the atmosphere we need, the ocean we need, the water cycle we need. In fact, in a book I've written on this, uh, Navigating Genesis, it'll be out in March, or there's a booklet out there that summarizes it, uh, Genesis 1, a scientific perspective, we calculate the probability of this collision giving us both a water cycle and a transparent atmosphere without God personally designing the collision. The probability is less than one chance in a trillion, 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 trillion. So when you look at the moon, you're seeing a miracle of God. Creation day three, let there be land masses. Now, this collision event also did something. 
Because what happened is the smaller the two planets, the one that was about twice the size of Mars, it transferred all of its heavy element material into the core of the Earth. And so the core of planet Earth has 630 times as much thorium as what we'd expect in a similar-sized rocky planet, and 340 times as much uranium. Now, uranium and thorium are long-lived radiometric isotopes, and that's where we get the energy source that drives plate tectonics, that forms our continents, and sets up a very strong magnetic field that protects us from deadly solar and cosmic radiation. Today, we understand Uh, the plate tectonic history of the Earth in sufficient detail that we can actually determine the rate at which the continents grew over the history of the Earth. And it establishes, for example, the Bible was right when it said that Earth began as a water world. In the beginning, all you have is water over the whole surface of the Earth. Then you get a couple of tiny volcanic islands. Then plate tectonics, thanks to the radiometric decay of uranium and thorium, begins to kick in and begins to make continents. But what I want you to notice on this graph is that time in the history of the Earth where you get the most aggressive growth of continental landmass happens when the Earth is about 2 billion years old. Now, the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. So if you were to overlay six creation days over the whole history of the Earth, guess where the formation of the continents would lie? About the beginning of day three. And so we see here as this graph confirms the chronology that we see in Genesis chapter one. The beginning of creation day three is when we see this aggressive growth of continental land masses. By the way, the continents are continuing to grow and 29% is what you need for advanced civilization. 28 won't work, 30 won't work, 29 is it. Which means there's actually a fairly narrow window of time in which we human beings can exist in the history of the Earth. And actually, I could show you other graphs, it's much narrower than 100,000 years. So that tells us that God wants to achieve the purpose for which he created us relatively quickly, uh, not over hundreds of thousands of years. Now, creation day three ends with God creating plants on the continental land masses. And again, I can recall a debate a few years back at the University of Texas uh, with Michael Shermer, where he ridiculed Genesis 1 for getting it wrong, because he claimed that the fossil record tells us that we have the Cambrian animals in the oceans showing up before we see plants on the continental land masses. But notice Genesis 1 has it the other way around. We have the land plants first, then the sea animals second. Now, my response to Michael Shermer at that time was to say, you know, these Cambrian animals, they have bones and they have shells. So the probability of leaving behind fossil evidence is relatively high. But plants are made up of tissues that don't preserve as well. So I'm not at all surprised we don't have fossil evidence of the plants that predate the Cambrian explosion animals. But things have changed. Back in 2009, these two authors in the British journal Nature published the first isotope evidence showing, because plants actually have a different isotope ratio than non-living carbonaceous material. And based on that isotope evidence, they were able to demonstrate that plants proliferated on the continental land masses for for 200 million years previous to the Cambrian explosion. They were just as abundant for 200 million years before as the 200 million years thereafter. And uh, just a little more than a year ago, uh, we have the discovery of the first fossils of uh, plants on the continental land masses that date well before the Cambrian explosion. Now, these are not complete fossils. The biggest fossil part they found was about a millimeter, so really tiny, but these are plants and by that means they're able to demonstrate that plants were just as abundant in the continental land masses for 600 million years before the Cameron explosion as the 600 million years that follow. Creation day four. Just like creation day one, it says, let there be the great lights, referring to the sun, moon, and stars. Then it explains why. 
Let there be the great light so they may serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years. Now, today we know how it is. Okay, what was happening here is that God was transforming the atmosphere from translucent to transparent. You all know what I mean by translucent? It's like going to British Columbia in the wintertime. It's just overcast the whole time. You know, we're in a drought. British Columbia is drowning in rain while we're having our drought. And uh, I remember uh, as a child, we went one winter with 72 days where it never stopped raining day or night. So when I first read about the flood, my comment was, gee, only 40 days and 40 nights. So, but that was torrential rain. We weren't getting torrential rain during that uh, whole time. <clears throat> but that's what we mean by translucent, where the clouds are there, light gets through, but you can't see what's beyond. Creation day four, let there be the great lights so that they may serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years. And I remember reading that at age 17, and I said, for whose benefit? Then it suddenly clicked. All the life before day four doesn't need to know where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky. If you're a bacterium or an insect, it doesn't matter. However, if you're a bird or a mammal, or even if you're a mollusk, You need to know where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky, at least on occasion, so you know when it's summer or winter, when to reproduce, when to migrate, when to hibernate. And that's what the text says. So they may serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years for all the advanced animals that God will create on day five and day six. And just a couple of months ago, and you'll see an article on this on our website, we discovered what it was that transformed the atmosphere from translucent to transparent. Basically what's happening is all the plants that God had created in the oceans and on the continental land masses were taking carbon dioxide and water out of the atmosphere and pumping oxygen back into the atmosphere. So reducing the carbon dioxide and water vapor and pumping up the oxygen is what transformed the cloud nature of our atmosphere uh, where light could now pass through. And as you can see by this graph here, that you uh, get a rather sudden jump up just before the Cambrian explosion. And this is what you see on creation day five, uh, namely that the very moment that oxygen in the atmosphere hits about 8 to 10% quantity, God immediately creates these animals. These animals can't exist unless they got that much oxygen. But the moment oxygen hits that minimum level, God aggressively creates these proliferation of animals in the seas. And that's what it says at the beginning of creation day five, uh, that God creates these swarms of small sea animals. Now, it really are swarms. I mean, today on planet Earth, we have about 30 phyla of animals. That's 30 basic body plans of animals. There was more than double that at the time of the Cameron explosion. And they all show up at once. Now, I remember when I was in high school, we were studying this, and the belief was that the phylum that we're part of, the chordates, they showed up about 40 to 50 million years after the Cameron explosion began. Today, we know they show up right at the beginning of the Cameron explosion, even including the vertebrates, the vertebrates show up right at the beginning of the Cameron explosion. So they all show up at once, and over half of the phyla have disappeared. As one evolutionary biologist declared, this is evolution going the wrong way. They all suddenly appear, and then they begin to disappear. Now, let me show you a couple of comments uh, from some of the leading evolutionary biologists who do take a non-theistic perspective. Uh, probably the most famous atheist in the world today would be uh, Britain's Richard Dawkins. Uh, he's uh, very blunt and aggressive in his attack against God. Uh, but back in 1987, he wrote a book called The Blind Watchmaker, in which he tried to claim that God was not behind life. But this is what he said about the Cambrian explosion. Quote, the Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years ago, are the oldest ones in which we find most of the major invertebrate groups. And we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. 
And this is recognized as the biggest problem of the fossil record uh, for the non-theistic worldview. The fact that we just have this amazing explosive event that literally comes out of nowhere. I mean, what you've got is a planet with bacteria on it, and then suddenly these animals pop up out of nowhere. Or Kevin Peterson wrote a review just a few years back where he said this, elucidating the materialistic basis, that is the non-theistic basis for the Cambrian explosion, has become more elusive, not less, the more we know about the event itself. And that's kind of the main theme of reasons to believe. Namely, the more we learn about the record of nature, the greater the evidence accumulates that the God of the Bible is responsible for what we see. And the Cameron explosion is one of the most dramatic examples of that. Now, as we at Reasons to Believe engage scientists on the question of the origin of life, <clears throat> what we discover is all of their focus is on the origin of the first life on planet Earth, the bacteria that show up literally out of nowhere 3.8 billion years ago. But as you read Genesis 1, it speaks about three separate origins of life. And so in creation day 5, second part of creation day 5, it talks about the second origin of life, life that's not only physical, but life that's physical and soulish. In fact, it uses two verbs. It says of these uh, creatures uh, that God made them and he created them. Now, the word create is exclusively used for something that's brand new that never existed before. Now, the bodies of these creatures, basically the birds and the sea mammals, as God created the birds, he created the sea mammals, but he uses this Hebrew word nefesh to refer to these animals. And that means a soulish animal. An animal that's not only physical, but is endowed by God with mind, will, and emotions so that they can form relationships with one another, but also relationships with human beings. These are the animals that care for the young, where the parents will sacrifice for the young. But these are also the animals that we can tame so that they can serve and please us. Birds and sea mammals. And then in creation day six, the text talks about three specialized kinds of land mammals. Now, again, I can recall debates I had with Michael Shermer where he said, Genesis gets it wrong here too because it puts the land mammals after the sea mammals. But what I had to point out to him, in Creation Day 5 talks about God creating sea mammals generically and birds generically, but it never addresses the time when God creates land mammals generically. Instead, what you have on creation day six is God jumping ahead and singling out three highly specialized kinds of land mammals, advanced land mammals that God created specifically to help human beings launch and sustain civilization. And this is a theme that's taken up in much more detail in Job 38 and 39, where God makes the point that these certain categories of birds and mammals are crucial to launch and sustain civilization. And the proof of that is those regions of the world where humans did not have access to those animals never got out of the Stone Age. In fact, we now recognize is that when humans came into Australia, for example, they quickly wiped out the animals that existed there that God had created to help them launch civilization. Consequently, the Aborigines in Australia remained in a Stone Age technology until Europeans brought them the animals that they needed. Same thing happened in North and South America. And there's reasons, but I'll, uh, we discuss that in our books. But um, the three categories that are mentioned on Creation Day 6 are the short-legged land mammals. This is a reference to rodents. You say, what do we need rodents for for civilization? Well, the thing about the human body, it's beautifully designed to survive in a very warm climate. I mean, we're bipedal, which means not that much sunlight falls on our bodies. And we're slim, not like Neanderthal, so again, not much exposure of sun on our bodies. Uh, we don't have a lot of hair, and so we can radiate heat to the environment efficiently, and we've got this wonderful perspiration system. And when we perspire like no other animal, which is what keeps us cool. 
but our bodies are very poorly designed for a cold climate. I mean, try going outside in your bathing suit uh, in Winnipeg in the wintertime. Uh, you're not going to survive very long. In fact, I heard uh, last week when we had that big cold spell that it was actually colder in Winnipeg than it was on the surface of Mars. So, but thanks to these rodents, because rodents are small and warm-blooded, The only way they can keep warm in a cool climate is to grow thick, luxuriant fur. And early humans quickly figured out that this was an excellent clothing source. And so when we look at the earliest findings of human beings, we see that they're already sewing together the pelts of rodents uh, for clothing. And the wonderful thing about rodents, they don't mind living with thousands of their buddies in a small enclosure. And uh, they're easily tamed by humans, I mean, I remember going into a, a rat lab at the University of British Columbia where they had 10,000 laboratory rats, and the owner there, the guy who was managing it, said, pick up any rat, he'll tolerate it. And he was right. I'm a strange human being, but I could pick up any rat and no problem. And so uh, this is what helped us with clothing. Today we've got PETA. They don't like us using rodents for clothing. Uh, and we really don't need them because we've got technology But here's where we really do need the rodents. You know, God designed different categories of these higher animals with identical DNA to us human beings where it was crucial for medical research. So, for example, with the great apes, the DNA that uh, governs their internal organs is virtually identical to us human beings, which means medical researchers can take, say, a kidney or a heart out of a baboon or an ape and put it in a human being, and it'll work. Uh, and the thing we notice about mice and rats, they have the identical DNA that governs the chemical pathways for memory. And so right now, researchers are studying mice and rats to come up with cures for dyslexia, Alzheimer's, and dementia, because mice and rats have got the same DNA that we have Uh, in that particular part of the genome. Now, that doesn't mean we're descended from mice and rats. It just means that the creator made sure we had the animals we needed and purposely designed them with the appropriate DNA identity that we could use them for medical advance. And the text talks about God also creating two different kinds of long-legged land mammals, one group that's easy to tame that he intended that we would use for agriculture. So this would include the Uh, goats, the sheep, the cows. And then he also created long-legged land mammals that were difficult to tame. Easy to tame, herbivores. Difficult to tame, carnivores. Now, the herbivores make excellent agricultural animals, but they make terrible household pets. I mean, try bringing a cow into your living room. You'll discover you can't housebreak the thing, It's got to eat all day, it defecates all day, and it emits these noxious fumes. And because it's eating and digesting all day, it's really not that free and able to entertain your children. But it's different with the carnivores. You can housebreak them. Uh, they can take care of their chloric needs. Well, at least the ones we have in our home, they take care of their chloric needs in under two minutes a day. And the rest of the time, they're free to entertain the family. And because they're carnivores, they can do things that herbivores can't do. And uh, so God gave us this list. In fact, there's a more extensive list uh, in the book of Job. In fact, the book, this is a book I wrote just a, a little more than a year ago, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, which really focuses on the second origin of life. And what I love about Job, he says, God only gave us these animals to help us launch civilization and to serve and please us, but also to teach us lessons about ourselves and about God. Basically, what God does in these animals says, look at the birds and mammals. Notice that they've been designed and motivated to serve and please a higher species, namely human beings. Likewise, you humans are designed to serve and please a higher being, namely God himself. Notice that your sin and abuse causes these animals to run away from you instead of towards you. Likewise, your sin and abuse causes you to run away from God instead of towards him so that you can have a loving relationship with him. So look to the birds, look to the mammals. They will teach you things. And the thing I've noticed as I've traveled around the world, the atheists live in cities. 
I mean, I have run into one or two in the countryside, but predominantly they live in the cities. And the principle is this. If you have significant contact with these birds and mammals, both the tame ones and the wild ones, you know that there must be a God. But if you're cut off from these animals, you can deceive yourself into thinking that maybe there's no God at all. So yeah, every atheist I debated has been an urbanite. And maybe that's the problem today. The majority of humans now live in cities instead of in the countryside. In fact, you can plot a graph. The rise of atheism is uh, related to the rise of urbanization. Then God creates human beings. This is his final creative act. And here again, it uses the word God made us and he created us. Now, our bodies are not brand new. Other animals have bodies. The soulishness is not brand new. Birds and mammals have that. But what is brand new is the spirit. So what the text is saying is that God has made one and only one species that is body, soul, and spirit. And so as these uh, birds and mammals can relate to us, we're designed to discover and relate to God himself. And the text tells us that There was evening and morning for the first six days. But notice there's no evening and morning for day seven. One reason why I think Genesis 1 is a source of a lot of uh, debate is that we end it not at Genesis 2-4. Genesis 1 ends with the six days. The seventh day is described in the first four verses of Genesis uh, 2. But in those verses, you notice, there's no evening and morning for day seven. And when I read that at age 17, it answered for me a problem, an enigma that had bothered me since I was nine years of age. At age nine, my parents um, got just a little bit of money, and they said they actually bought me a whole bunch of books on evolution. And I read all those books, and I recognized there's something a little bit strange here. We have all this evidence for speciation before humanity and virtually none afterwards. How come we're not seeing it now, whereas we were seeing it all over the place before? And when I read Genesis 1, <clears throat> it answered for me that enigma. Namely, we see an average of one new species of life showing up per year before humans arrive and virtually none afterwards. Genesis 1, for six days God creates. On the seventh day, he stops creating. In fact, what's actually going on right now Biologists are doing what they call long-term evolution experiments where they take bacteria and yeast and watch what happens to it over a 30-year period. 30 years of bacterial evolution is equivalent to about 1.5 million years of human evolution. And these experiments are telling us how limiting the natural processes are to bring about significant changes in life. But we see it all over the place before humanity. Why? God was intervening in the record of nature. Today, he doesn't intervene. So it was a wonderful uh, insight to discover. This answers the fossil record enigma. It also answered for me why it is the majority of scientists don't believe in God. I mean, what I hear from scientists is that I don't see any evidence of God's handiwork in my scientific research. Well, as an astronomer, I see it everywhere. But here's the difference. In astronomy, almost all of our data comes from the past uh, because it takes light time to travel from distant stars and galaxies to our telescope. In fact, nothing is in the present in astronomy. I share that with my wife, that because I'm an astronomer, I cannot be held responsible for the present. All of my data comes from the past. But in biology, it's different. The vast majority of biologists do their research in the human era. And because it's God's day of rest, they will see no evidence for God's supernatural intervention in their research. But it explains why the majority of mathematicians, physicists, and astronomers are believers, because we're getting so much of our data from before the human era. But here's the conundrum. There's only about 12,000 research astronomers in the whole world. There's over 3 million research biologists. So we are heavily outnumbered. And that explains why it is that the majority of scientists say we see no evidence. But here's the good news. 
The figure is now 25% of biologists do believe in a God and an afterlife. In 1970, it was only 1%. It's gone up to 25%. Mainly because they brought mathematics into the graduate curriculum of research biology. But this is what happened to me at age 19. It took me two years to go through the Bible. I was literally from the age of 17 forward spending a minimum of an hour a day studying the Bible, looking for a provable error or contradiction. I didn't find any. I found lots of things I didn't understand, but I didn't find any provable error or contradictions. I said, that can only be because this text comes from the one that created everything and the fact that it predicted everything that we scientists know to be true so many thousands of years in advance. And as I looked at Genesis 1, recognizing that the word yom, translated day, uh, must be a long time period. The Hebrew word for day has four different literal definitions, part of the daylight hours, all the daylight hours, a 24-hour period, or a long but finite period of time. But given that we're still in the seventh day, these days must be long time periods. So appreciating that, and the frame of reference for the six days is the surface of the earth, this is the score that Genesis 1 gets relative to the established record of nature. It gets a perfect score of 4 for 4 on the description of the initial conditions and for 10 for 10 on the description of the creation events mentioned in Genesis 1 and gets it all in the correct chronological order. And I remember calculating the probability that Moses could just come up with this without divine inspiration. That probability is far more remote than one chance in a quadrillion, 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 quadrillion. So I said, this is something that was inspired by the Creator. And I actually found over 200 places in the Bible where the Bible had accurately predicted future scientific discoveries and likewise calculated the probability that the Bible authors could record this without divine inspiration. And the probability was less than one chance in 10 to the 300th power. Now that's 300 zeros, 299 zeros between the decimal point and the one. And what I realized, and well, here, here was something that was actually talk about timing. I came up with that probability, less than one chance in 10 to the 300th power uh, that the Bible was simply inspired by humans and not by God. In the same week, my sophomore physics professor gave us the problem assignment of calculating that one of us in our classroom of 600 uh, would be killed by a sudden reversal of the second law of thermodynamics. You say, can that really happen? It could really happen. In this auditorium, you've got quadrillions of air molecules. And I can tell you, they're not all at the same temperature. Trillions of them are below the freezing point of water. And there's a finite possibility that those trillions of air molecules in this room, below the freezing point of water, will wander in the vicinity of this young woman here and freeze her to death. You want to know what that probability is? One chance in 10 to the 80th that you're going to be killed in the next few minutes by the sudden reversal of the second law <laughs> of thermodynamics. But you know, that probability is so incredibly tiny that we know it's never happened anytime, anywhere in the universe. But notice what I did at age 19. Demonstrate this book we call the Bible is at least 10 to the 220 times more reliable than a law of physics that every one of us trusts every second of our life. And I recognize it would simply be irrational for me no, not to put even greater trust and confidence in the one that inspired this book. And that's what motivated me at age 19, at about 1 o'clock in the morning, one August night, to sign my name in the back of this book, uh, committing my life to Jesus Christ, uh, receiving the offer of his moral perfection from my moral imperfection, and also recognizing it was foolish not to put the creator of the universe in charge of my life. He knows better than I do the best way to run my life. So I made him my savior as well as uh, my master. Eight years later, I met Christians. It happened on the Caltech campus, and the Christians in the astronomy department there showed me how to find a church, say, aren't there churches in Canada? 
Every church I checked out in Canada, either the pastor didn't believe the Bible was the word of God or it was a cult. Um, but having met Christians in the astronomy department at Caltech, they showed me how to find a good church. I began attending that church. Seven months later, they put me on their pastoral staff. Uh, that church helped me launch Reasons to Believe 11 years later, and I still serve on the staff of that church. With that, I'd like to segue, by the way, if you want to read up a little more on this, let me uh, move ahead here. Yeah, do get this free DVD. And then there's this uh, DVD that we are charging $5 for. You can buy it from the Skeptic Society for $30, but we sell it for 5 <laughs> And what it is, uh, it's a debate that I had at uh, Caltech in front of the International Skeptic Society Conference, worldwide conference, where they brought these uh, uh, atheist scientists from around the world to speak, and at the end they had me debate the particle physicist Victor Stenger. And uh, you've got to hear what Victor Stenger says at the end, uh, a remarkable concession. One other thing I can say about that event, 700 atheists packed the auditorium. And at the end, I sh was talking to a lot of these atheists, and I said, today I saw a brand new evidence for God, one I'd never seen before. That got their curiosity. I said, what is it? And I said, well, I noticed that the six scientists you had speak here all spoke against the God of the Bible. They didn't address Hinduism, Buddhism, or Islam. It was all targeting the God of the Bible. The other thing I noticed is how passionate your speakers and all of you are here in the audience about the non-existence of God. I said, if you were really convinced that God doesn't exist, that God of the Bible doesn't exist, uh, you would be treating him like the tooth fairy or the Easter bunny. But your passion tells me you really do believe he exists, but you don't like him. Now, here was their response. They said, Dr. Ross, it's not that we hate the God of the Bible. It's that we despise his followers. And they all began to share stories with me about how they've been offended by Christians. But the reason why they're willing to share those stories, their intellectual barriers have been removed in the debate. In fact, what I heard from those atheists was this. We had never before heard that there were scientific evidences of God. This is the first time we've heard this. So we want you to understand how the evidence, as we talk about it, reasons to believe, stand up when you've got research scientists or atheists uh, who are critiquing it. I think it'll encourage you. You please use it as a, as a tool. And in a couple of months, we'll be bringing out this book, Navigating Genesis. But as promised, we're going to take your questions. And so as I understand it, you can use your smartphone or your tablet or whatever uh, to uh, text us a question. We actually got a computer here where we can take that. They're going to tell me what questions come in, and hopefully I can answer them. Yeah, here we go. So looks like we already got some questions coming in. So, but uh, hey, feel free. And by the way, we're going to take some of these questions, and uh, then I'm going to go over to the underground, and there we'll just take questions live from the floor. But let's take a few minutes with these. All right. Here's the first question that uh, we have in is strong evidence exists for a wide variety of now extinct species, uh, tribulites, dinosaurs, etc., over billions of years not mentioned in the scriptures. What purpose do you think was the existence of all these life forms? Well, a good text to look for the Bible does mention these is Psalm 104. Psalm 104 is all about creation. <clears throat> And when it says there about life is that God packs the earth with as much life as possible. The whole psalm is talking about no matter where you go in the earth, the highest mountains, the deepest oceans, under the ocean, you find life. God has packed the earth with life with the greatest possible variety, the greatest possible abundance for the greatest possible time. And the thing that's striking astronomers <clears throat> when they look at the earth we now have evidence that life began on planet Earth 3.825 billion years ago. And it was a whole ecology of bacteria. So the Earth was filled with all kinds of life that the laws of physics at that time would permit. We also realize that you can't have life any earlier than that. 
That's the earliest moment in the history of the universe where the laws of physics would even permit the existence of life. But the earliest moment is when God creates it. Now, why does he do that? The reason why he puts life on planet Earth the earliest possible moment and why he creates us at the last possible moment is so that we human beings can have the benefit of a planet that's loaded with biodeposits. I mean, look at the city of Los Angeles. 99% of the construction material is biodeposits. So it's life being created uh, and going extinct, building up the limestone, coal, oil, natural gas. All the metals that we mine are concentrated by bacterial activity. So when our family celebrates Thanksgiving, we thank God for three billion years of sulfate-reducing bacterial activity because without it, we wouldn't have silverware, we wouldn't have iron pots or aluminum. Uh, thank God for all those bacteria that made that possible. So we are the beneficiaries of God creating all these dinosaurs, all these bacteria, all the mollusks, the Cameron explosion animals, because we can reap those resources to launch and sustain civilization. Why does God want us to have civilization? So we can take advantage of these resources that God planted in the crust of the earth so that we can quickly and efficiently take the good news of salvation with Jesus Christ to all the people groups of the world. And the Bible tells us the moment we do that, God will replace this universe with a brand new creation. A brand new creation where life is going to be unbelievably rewarding. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. I don't know about you. I'm going to have to change some of my Thanksgiving prayers and thanks. <laughs> That's what I'm going to have to do. Um, the next question we have is, how can I describe to my 9 and 11-year-olds that God has always been? Okay. The Bible tells us that uh, God has always existed. Uh, eternity past, he'll exist to eternity future. How do we get that point across to little children? Well, I've been impressed. I mean, sometimes they actually let me loose on the three-year-olds in our church. And uh, the thing that I've been trying to encourage parents with this, don't be surprised that the moment your children can talk, they start hitting you with deep theological questions. That is evidence that we were created as spiritual beings. And what I share with parents in our church, don't tell them, I'll answer that question when you're older. You need to answer it right away. When they're curious is when they're most ready to receive it. Um, I'm not sure we got the DVD out there, but you can get this from our website. It's called uh, Beyond the Cosmos. And it's a DVD I did on television, which basically shows children that, number one, God is not constrained to space and time like we are. He transcends time. And, uh, you know, how can God answer the prayers of every... My, both, both my boys asked me this question when they were three and a half. Dad, how can God listen to the prayers of every kid in the world that's praying at the same time? And my answer was, because God is not constrained to linear time. He can move and operate in geometric time. Now, of course, I had to explain what that meant. <laughs> but what I got was a bunch of sticks, and you'll actually see this on the DVD, showing that, you know, our time is a line, and we're going forward on that single line. But what if time were a plane, where you've got a length of time and a width of time? Then that means that you could have the timeline of the universe over here, and God could live in a timeline over here that never crosses or touches a timeline of our universe. As such, God would have no beginning, no ending, and would be uncreated. Because that was another question both my boys asked at three and a half. If God created the universe and God created us, who created God? I says, well, if he's in geometric time, he's not created. But any entity constrained to linear time must be created. Notice that everything in the universe is constrained to linear time, where time can't be stopped or reversed. Little kids get that. And uh, therefore, everything in the universe ultimately is traceable back to a creation event. And what I share with children is there is a straightforward one-sentence proof that there must be a creator because everything we look at is constrained in linear time. 
and there must be a creator beyond linear time that creates this. I'll let you in another little secret. Three- and four-year-olds get this more easily than 40- and 50-year-olds. And my wife says, you know, you really are. Your parents are right. You're a compulsive scientist. Because I remember when our boys were like three and four months of age, I did experiments on them. (laughs) And the kind of experiment I did is I would transfer their three-dimensional toy with a two-dimensional cutout that was the same color and the same size and I noticed they couldn't tell the difference. But when they got to be seven months old, they could tell the difference. And I did this on a few different children, discovering that children are born thinking two-dimensionally. By the time they get a few months old, they transition to three-dimensional thinking, but the problem is you kind of get stuck in three-dimensional thinking. The reason why I think a three-year-old gets this more easily than a 50-year-old A three-year-old is only two and a half years away from transitioning from two-dimensional thinking to three-dimensional thinking. The problem with many of you is that you've been in a three-dimensional rut for 40 years, and it's a little bit hard to think about a God who transcends 10 space-time dimensions. But I'll tell you this. Physicists many years ago proved that the universe we live in has nine dimensions of space, not just three which means God is bigger than those nine dimensions. And that's what I share with little children. If God is bigger than the dimensions we know exist, what does that tell us about the power of God and what does it tell us about his capacity to listen to all of our prayers and to answer all of our prayers? That was a huge motivator in getting my sons to pray every night. Before that, they were kind of saying, why bother? Just that little explanation, they got it figured out. Hey, the DVD does a lot better than I could do in these couple of minutes. You really need object lessons with children. It's better if you actually show them uh, with object lessons than trying to, to talk them through it. All right. Why do Big Bang cosmologists assume there is no edge or center to the universe? Well, in the Bible, it's in the Psalms and also in the book of Isaiah, It tells us that God expands the universe like one would take a tent that's curled up in a backpack and unfurl it and stretch it out so you could live in it. And the wonderful thing about that figure of speech, and it is a figure of speech, is the universe is kind of like that. You know, the reality of a tent is not its interior or its exterior, but its surface. And likewise, we know the universe is a surface. And so all the stars and galaxies are constrained to the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe, where we ignore the six tiny space dimensions that accompany the three big ones. Say, what's interior to the surface? Nothing. What's exterior to the surface? Nothing. Everything is on the surface, including all the space-time dimensionality. You cannot say there's empty space interior to the space because there is no space interior to the space surface of the universe, which is why there's no center to the universe, there's nothing outside, there's nothing inside, but the surface does get bigger and bigger as the universe gets older and older. So if you want to know what's out there, just wait until the surface gets there. You'll be there in uh, not too long a period of time. And if you want a, a prosaic analogy, think of planet Earth. Planet Earth is three physical dimensions, length, width, and height. It's a solid uh, body. But notice we humans live on the two-dimensional surface of the three-dimensional Earth. We don't live interior or exterior. We live on the surface. Likewise, all the stars and galaxies, including the space-time fabric, is constrained to the surface of the universe. But it has three dimensions instead of two. All right, here's the next one. How is it genetically possible for all of humankind to have come from one man and one woman? Well, that question is a major debate that's uh, raging within the Christian community and outside the Christian community. In fact, we're currently engaging theistic evolutionists on this very issue. Because within evolutionary creationism and theistic evolution, is this idea that we're not descended from one man and one woman, rather we're descended from a few thousand men and women. 
However, you can go to our website and we're giving you the latest scientific evidence which shows that it's much more likely that we are descended from one man and one woman. And the problem is in evolutionary creationism and theistic evolution, what they do is they look at the DNA of humans all over the world and the differentiation of that DNA, and by that means, by measuring the natural mutation rate, try to discover the ancestral population of human beings. But that calculation presumes ahead of time a Darwinian model for the evolution of human beings. If that model is incorrect, the conclusion is incorrect. And what we've been doing is we've been engaging the, the leading evolutionary creationists and theistic evolutionists is pointing out the field experiments do not match your theoretical predictions. Now, as an astronomer, we never go forward with an idea until the observations, the experiments, and the theory match. But what I notice in biology, often that's not done. And what we notice in biology, for example, if you look at a pair of sheep and put them on an island and watch them reproduce over a period of a few decades and go, say, 10 or 20 generations later and sample the DNA, the differentiation in that DNA is far greater than what the theoretical models predict. That's also true for horses. It's also true for orangutans. You always get a result that's greater, which means that the evolutionary model, the Darwinian model that's, that's used as a base for these calculations is oversimplified. And I'll tell you this, I began writing articles on this 30 years ago. And at that time, uh, they were claiming the ancestral population of humans was 1 million. And then they said it was 100,000. And then it dropped down to 10,000. And my colleague, uh, Fazrana, debated Dennis Venema up in Canada a few years ago, Dennis said 1,200. Now they're saying 800. And saying, let's plot a graph. Let's see, it was 1 million 30 years ago, 100,000, 10,000, 12,000, 10,000, 800. It seems like it's heading down towards two. And let's not be too hasty to abandon the creedal statement on the interpretation of Romans 5 and Romans 8. And that's really what people are doing. They're claiming this genetic evidence means we've got to reinterpret the book of Romans. I'm saying it's not the way it is. Um, and there is no scientific case that we must be descended from a large ancestral population. But the articles are up on our website. Awesome. Since there are hundreds of billions of galaxies with billions of stars in each, it seems highly probable that there would be life on other planets in the universe. Does the Bible give any clues about life outside of Earth? Uh, what is your personal feeling on this? Well, that's a good question. And uh, about 20 years ago, I got together three astronomers. Uh, and the three of us wrote an article, Is There Life Elsewhere in the Universe? And I defended the position that God doesn't waste his miracles. And as I read the Bible, he only needs one planet to fulfill the purpose for why he created the universe. And also, I recognize if you want one planet in which there is advanced life, you're going to need 50 billion trillion other stars. The entire universe, all of its mass, all of its size is crucial to get one planet. Uh, but another astronomer defended the view that God seems to be compulsively creative. Just look at the earth. He's creating all diverse kinds of life you can imagine. And so he says, I don't think God can stop. He's going to create life elsewhere. So he was saying, there's going to be life on all kinds of planets, but they're all going to be supernaturally designed. It won't be natural process. Then a third astronomer defended a position in between where he said, well, maybe there'll be bacteria on another planet, but there won't be grass, there won't be dolphins. Or all three of us agreed. The book of Hebrews tells us Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, died one time, one place for all, which means that there's only one planet on which there's intelligent life in need of redemption. And therefore, we all agreed on that one point. Uh, but when I debated Victor Stenger at Caltech, 
Both of us agreed that the entire universe is hostile to advanced life except planet Earth. And now we have found over a thousand planets outside of our solar system. None of those planets are anything like any of the planets of our solar system. In fact, the discovery of those 1,000 plus planets has taught us every planet in our solar system plays a crucial role in making advanced life possible here on planet Earth. So, yeah, we also thank God on Thanksgiving for Jupiter and Saturn <laughs> and uh, Mars. <laughs> And I just have turkey and mashed potatoes. That's, I'm pretty thankful for that. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, we, we rely so heavily upon uh, carbon dating to support scientific theory, observation, and discovery. How do we know that C14 dating can be trusted? Well, C14 dating is one of dozens of different radiometric tools. And each radiometric tool has its realm where it gives you accurate dates and its realm where it doesn't. And the principle here is it will give you good dates if you're within a factor of six of the half-life. Now, the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,715 years. You can multiply that by six and divide it by six. That's the range where you can trust it. So roughly, say, from 1,000 years ago uh, to about 30,000 years ago, is where you can get reliable dates. If it's uh, younger than 1,000 years, you're not going to get a good date. Or if it's older than a 30 to 35,000 years, you will not get a good date. The other thing about carbon-14, it tells you how long something has been dead. So you can't date rocks with carbon-14. You can only date things that have once been alive. So it's great for di dating Bible manuscripts because Bible manuscripts are made of once living material, either papyrus or paper. So it tells you how long ago that papyrus or paper uh, was harvested uh, to make a scroll or a Bible manuscript. And by that means, we've been able to date some ancient Bible manuscripts to about plus or minus two-year precision. So that's an example where carbon-14 uh, gives you a reliable date. The other thing you can do is calibrate it. So, for example, you can go to Antarctica and you'll see all these layers of ice and you get one layer every year. And we know they're annual layers because you can see the dust signature of volcanic eruptions in those layers. And in those layers will be carbon-14. And so by looking at the carbon-14 and say 100,000 or 500,000 annual layers of Antarctic ice, you can actually determine whether or not it has changed. And it actually does change a little bit because carbon-14 uh, is decayed through exposure to cosmic rays. And cosmic rays are not steady constant. They vary a little bit because cosmic rays come from supernova eruptions. And so if you get a recent supernova eruption, that will slightly disturb uh, the rate of carbon-14 decay. But that can be carefully calibrated through the ice cores. All right. This one starts off with a thanks for your ministry, Dr. Ross. Um, how do you define the singularity in light of books by Krauss and Hawking? Well, uh, I wrote a detailed review of Lawrence Krauss's book, Universe from Nothing. It's up on our website. You can read it for free. And uh, we talk about the singularity there. But what's interesting, and I mentioned this in my talk, is that uh, the space-time theorems and the uh, proof for a singularity, and by the way, it's a technical term. When physicists talk about a singularity, they're talking about the beginning of space and time. And the beginning of space and time implies there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that created the universe. And it was Lawrence Krauss who wrote about three-quarters of the way through his book uh, that deism uh, could not be avoided. Uh, which means that there has to be some kind of causal agent that's responsible for the mathematics, the laws of physics, and the existence of the universe. But Lawrence Krauss to this day is adamant uh, that God does not intervene beyond the creation of the universe and the setting up of the physics. And so, quite properly, it's a deistic uh, point of view. The idea that God created 13.8 billion years ago and has been taking a very long nap ever since, letting the natural process do everything else. 
But you can read my critique of uh, his book on our uh, website. All right, and we're going to uh, do this one as our last just uh, in the auditorium question. Again, afterwards uh, in the lobby, he'll have resources, and his staff will be there that you can ask some questions to, as well as Dr. Ross will be in undergrounds uh, if we didn't get to your question um, or maybe something come up and you have another question. Uh, he'll be in there for a little while. Uh, but this, this question came in. Uh, just what is a simple way to tell an unbeliever uh, that's a friend, a family member, uh, that God exists through astronomy. Just one simple thing. Where would you start them with? Well, what I would start is uh, by demonstrating that we now have evidence that the universe has a beginning. And uh, this is something that is not disputed amongst astronomers, whether they be atheists or agnostics or deists, that the universe really does have a beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. And therefore, there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that created it all. And that's what distinguishes the God of the Bible from the gods of other religions. As I mentioned, the gods of the Eastern religions have God creating within space and time that eternally exists. God is subject to space and time in those religions. In Christianity, God is the master, the creator of space and time. Then I would follow that up with what has been termed the anthropic principle. And there's been a lot of books written on that, almost all of them by non-Christians, pointing out that when we look at the universe, we see in the words of Paul Davies, an agnostic astronomer, overwhelming evidence that has been designed to make possible the existence of human beings. Uh, or as a physicist Freeman Dyson put it, when you look at the universe, you cannot avoid the conclusion that somehow the universe knew we human beings were coming. It was designed in advance for human beings. And there's actually an, uh, a compendium on our website, reasons.org slash fine-tuning. We'll pop up a 300-page compendium where we document all that evidence for design. But what I would share with a skeptic that evidence for the supernatural design of the universe for the benefit of the human beings over the past 25 years has gotten a million times stronger every month. Which means if you're not convinced today, wait a month and see how much stronger the evidence becomes. But is that fine-tuning design evidence that shows us that God not only transcends space and time, God is personal. I mean, if you were to ask me as an astronomer, where do we find uh, the most spectacular evidence for supernatural design? I would say dark energy. Dark energy makes up three quarters of the stuff of the universe. But change the quantity by as little as one part in 10 to the 122nd power, there's no possibility for life anytime, anywhere in the universe. And the degree of fine-tuning design there exceeds the best example of human creativity and design by more than a factor of a hundred trillion, 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 trillion times, which means that the God that created the universe is at least that many times smarter than we human beings, at least that many times more knowledgeable and that many times more powerful or better funded than we human beings. <laughs> Well, thank you so much uh, for coming.